Okay, well, let me go ahead and introduce um, our speaker today. We have uh, Carl Legs from Purdue. He just recently moved from Texas A&M to Purdue, so we're happy to have him on this uh, on this webinar. He's going to be talking today about parallel computing and op opportunities in nonlinear optimization. And uh, many of the many of the people, including myself, on this online are benefiting from his uh, his work on IPI, uh together with uh, Andreas Watcher and Larry Beagler and others who have worked on that. And um, and uh, he, so he's he's going to be talking today. I'll let him introduce the topic. But you know, many applications of optimization, parameter estimation, and decision making under uncertainty. And uh, let me let me skip on to the uh, biography for Carl. Um, Carl, uh, he's he's uh, as I mentioned, just recently moved to Purdue University, and his research interests are in large-scale nonlinear optimization and parallel scientific computing. He has been the recipient of, uh, for example, the Wilkinson Prize for the American Software. His work with IPOP, and then also he received a career award from the National Science Foundation. And he's also an excellent teacher. Uh, he's received the Montag uh, Center for Teaching Excellence Award. Uh, first off, I want to um, I want to say thanks to uh, to John Hedengren for putting this whole series together. Um, it's non-trivial to arrange all these things and get everything set up for the WebEx and to find speakers, and then um, all the efforts afterwards to um, post things online and, uh, and make sure everybody has access. So, um, John, I uh, I really appreciate it, and I know several other people do as well. Um, I'll also I'll also make another comment. Um, looking at the attendee list, and uh, there are a number of optimization and control experts in the room. This presentation, um, I wasn't exactly sure what audience we were going to get, so it's pretty high level. So feel free to stop me um, at any. Time and we can um, discuss details, and I can maybe pull up um, um, other slides that show more of the, uh, the detail from other presentations. Okay, so uh, let me first uh, kick off here. I've shown this slide many times, but I think it makes a very salient point. Um, what I'm showing in this figure is on the bottom axis is the year from 1980 until about 2012. On the side axis in log scale, I'm showing the clock rate for um, retail Intel CPUs. And I think if you have a look at this figure, remember this is a log scale already, if you have a look at this figure, you see um, tremendous growth, or tremendous increase in the speed of the clock rate of, of CPUs until about 2003 when we see a very, very sharp stagnation in clock rate. Now I'll be the first to admit clock rate is not the only thing that determines the uh, speed of, of any particular computing device, um, but it is one of the really important factors. And what we see around the year 2003 is a, a change in focus from the CPU manufacturers where some of this low-hanging fruit of increasing clock rate disappeared, and they had to focus on other mechanisms to um, more difficult and challenging mechanisms to keep increasing the speed of machines. Now, I don't think it should be any surprise to anyone if I add another axis to this figure, here I'm showing the number of cores that are available in Intel retail CPUs. And it shouldn't be too much of a shock that shortly after the clock rate stagnate, we start to see an increase in the number of cores um, available in standard machines. And it's pretty easy today to get a laptop with four cores and a desktop with 12 or 16 cores without, um, without too much difficulty. Now, wh why do we really care about this? Uh, this change in computing hardware. Well, it was recognized many, many years ago, and this is kind of a, um, an old uh, uh, demonstration that still holds true today, um, that e even though we've seen about 100 to 200 times speed increase per decade in simulation and optimization applications, about 50% of that speed increase came from new algorithm development, and about 50% of that speed increase we got for free as chemical engineers, as process systems engineers, we got for free simply because the computing hardware um, had improved in speed. And if you have a look again at this figure, this dramatic change in what's happening in the computing industry where we are seeing them focus a lot more on multi-core architectures, 
means as, as engineers and process systems engineers, if we don't start designing out and take advantage of these parallel architectures, we're, we're poised to lose that free speed improvement that we um, have kind of enjoyed for so long. Um, I don't have it on this figure here, but um, I think it's also worth pointing out that in addition to multi-core desktops, we also saw a tremendous increase in the use of, of other emerging architectures like graphics processing units, the GPU, uh, for scientific computing. And again, in about 2005, it was pretty easy to get a, a GPU for scientific computing with 128 cores. Um, today we can find um, these with thousands of cores uh, for relatively cheap um, uh, compared to the cost of a computer. So it's clear that our focus needs to shift towards um, algorithms that can take advantage of, of parallel computing. So to give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about parallel computing and some of the opportunities in nonlinear optimization. and to to do this justice, I think there's four things we need to consider. We need to consider architectures, algorithms, applications, and accessibility. Um, architectures, not all parallel computing architectures are created equal, and I'm going to briefly introduce um, how they're classified and, and what, that, uh, what that might mean for implementation. Um, I'll then talk a little bit in the algorithm section about how we measure algorithm performance and just give a very sort of high-level idea of of where opportunities are in nonlinear optimization for us to, you know, to develop parallel algorithms. Uh, I am not going to talk a lot about applications simply because of time constraints, but I will introduce a couple of problem classes where parallel computing has been, has been really effective in nonlinear optimization. And finally, I'll close with this topic of accessibility, by which I mean um, our ability to make um, parallel codes and research codes available to scientists and researchers and, and engineers to actually make use of them. So I'll talk there about modeling languages um, and, and open source software. Uh, so let, let me dive in here. Parallel computing architectures are traditionally classified according to something known as Flynn's taxonomy. And if you look here at this little table, um, on one side I'm talking about how many instructions can be performed in parallel. And on the top here I'm talking about um, uh, whether that those instructions uh, can be performed on a single piece of data or on multiple data sets. Now, when we think of a traditional serial CPU computing architecture, we are thinking of this SISD block here, where you've got one computer performing a single instruction at a time um, on the data that it uh, has access to. When we traditionally think about parallel computing architectures, we're, uh, what usually comes to mind is the MIMD architecture. This here, the um, different chips or different cores can perform uh, their instructions in parallel and they can operate on different data sets. So a, a, as simple as Word is running on one processor while Excel is running on another processor is, is an example of, of MIMD, um, where, where the two processors don't necessarily have to be doing the same thing. To give you an example of, of classic MIMD architectures, First is what we know well as the desktop uh, multi-core machines, which, which most people have uh, available today. Um, so for desktop multi-core, uh, the hardware is really affordable, um, but it typically employs a relatively low number of processors. Uh, so like I said, uh, uh, four is very common. Um, up to 16 is certainly reasonable to find. Uh, the benefit of doing parallel computing on some of these uh, architectures there are very standard compilers available to us, so there's a, there's a lot of tools that we can use. You can think about just doing threading, or you can think about um, other maybe more advanced messaging systems. Uh, because all of the cores are in uh, one sort of shared memory environment, uh, there can be extremely fast communication and, and not necessarily any network communication uh, between processes. Now, what we found with a lot of our applications is what ends up happening in, in using desktop multi-core architectures is we start to see memory access bottlenecks where, where multiple CPUs are trying to get access to RAM and, and since they're both doing, or since many of them are doing intensive processes, uh, we're actually limited by their ability to pull in numbers from RAM. And of course, since they're these shared memory architectures, the number of CPUs available to us is relatively small. Now another MIMD architecture that's common um, in science and engineering here is the Beowulf cluster. This is basically a large set of network computers. 
And you actually quite often see a hybrid architecture where there's a number of multi-core machines that are also connected by, um, by networking. Uh, it's pretty easy to get, I know this slide's a little bit old, but it's pretty easy to get hundreds or thousands of processors um, built into to these clusters. Um, at this point now, we need some sort of communication layer that's typically done over, over network or some specialized communication, but still over a wire connected between these machines. And we need to make, um, make use of, of maybe some specialized message passing interface, and there's a number of other tools like that to, to provide communication between the machines. Um, often in this case, it is said that the real bottleneck now becomes communication because transmitting data over, over Ethernet is slow. Now, in many applications that we've worked on, we still see memory bottleneck here on local, local nodes. So it really depends on the application, how much data you need to communicate. So I would argue this MIMD block is probably what most people think of when they, when they think of parallel computing. They have multiple cores in their machine, and uh, those cores can be running their own processes and possibly communicate between, uh, between processes. Now, there's another important class here called the SIMD architecture. Um, and this architecture is also, uh, this architecture is where we perform a single instruction at a time, so, so that the set of cores may only have a single instruction pointer on multiple data. Uh, now, what do I mean here? This sounds a bit a bit strange, but what I mean is if processor 1 is adding A1 to B1, then processor 2 must be adding A2 to B2. Um, so these architectures have to be coordinated in that the different cores need to be performing the same fundamental operation, um, even if they're doing that operation on, on different data sets. So you can see right away that this class is a lot more restrictive and uh, uh, we're not going to be able to do the, the example that I said earlier, for instance, where, where Word is running on one processor and Excel is running on another. There are a number of emerging architectures in this class and, and a number of older architectures as well. But um, in particular, the graphics processing unit is, is a hybrid SIMD architecture. Um, these are extremely affordable. We have access to thousands of processors for uh, maybe even $1,500. Uh, but their structure is very complex. They have multiple levels of memory that we need to worry about. Uh, different, different memory architectures have different uh, speeds at which we can access that memory, different latency. Um, in addition to that, so some of that memory might be constant from the aspect of the kernel running on the GPU, et cetera. So there are a lot of complexities and limitations that can be overcome. In addition to that, uh, these, these tools really require specialized compilers um, and languages in order to uh, parallelize. So you're going to need to learn some, some specialized software. We've done a lot of work with CUDA, for instance, which is a language released by NVIDIA for parallelizing scientific computations on their graphics processing units. So this, uh, this class shows a lot of hope for um, having massive parallelism, affordable massive parallelism, but unfortunately there are a lot of complexities at hand that, uh, that limit the availability of this architecture for a large number of problems. So we've got a little bit of a handle on the, the different architectures, and, and clearly, depending on what we're solving we're, uh, and the algorithm we're going to be using, uh, we may be able to target um, different architectures. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how we measure parallel performance, and there's two pieces I want to discuss. Uh, the first is speed up, and the second is efficiency. Um, so if we take a look at speed up, Speed up is generally um, computed as the, the time for the serial algorithm to perform divided by the time for the, for the algorithm running in parallel. Um, now we have to be a little bit careful here um, when we're reading to make sure we understand exactly what, what results are being shown um, because it's common to, to develop a, a some sort of decomposition algorithm and show the serial performance of that algorithm against the parallel performance of that algorithm. Um, but we should also be interested in um, maybe a more appropriate definition, which is the time for the best known serial algorithm over the time for the parallel algorithm. And so a lot of times when we develop a parallel decomposition code, um, when that code runs in serial, it performs worse than other better known or other known serial algorithms. And so when we think about speed up, uh, there's these two numbers that, uh, that are not interchangeable. Um, one is the speed up on the same algorithm, and the other is the speed up compared to the best known algorithm. And so we need to be careful what we're reporting and, and that we understand what we're seeing. 
The uh, second issue in parallel performance is looking at efficiency. Um, and efficiency we typically uh, talk about is the actual speed up divided by the ideal speed up. And this is the speed up that we observe when we um, run our algorithm divided by the number of processors, which would be essentially linear speed up, where we'd expect that uh, in the ideal case, if we had 16 processors, we would see 16 times um, speed up. Now, we don't actually see that for a number of reasons. And so efficiency gives us a measure of, of, of how well we can expect to sort of uh, uh, see the algorithm perform. Now, typically, this efficiency number is less than 1 uh, because of bottlenecks associated with the uh, parallel algorithm and a number of things that I'll talk about later. There are times when the speed up can be super linear. There are some very special cases where, where algorithms will actually see better than um, ideal speed up. Now, um, there's, a, there's a couple of cases where this, this can happen. One. Uh, which we've seen commonly uh, relates to the the cache size on um, a particular computing architecture. And so what happens is as you break the problem up into smaller and smaller chunks, you may end up getting to a point where uh, a significant chunk of that problem or, or basically the, the, the small piece that's working on a single CPU is able to better take advantage of the cache that's that the memory that's close to that CPU. And so in that case, you can actually see um, higher than ideal uh, efficiency. Um, the other spot where this happens, there are some algorithms that can uh, display this behavior, although in practice it's, it's rare. Um, but for instance, even mixed integer linear programming has the potential to have super linear speed up because in parallel they may find a better bound that allows them to fathom the tree that they uh, sooner than they would have found in serial. Now, I'd be interested to hear from the, the audience. In my experience, I have not seen that actually happen. Usually when I'm running parallel MILP codes, um, I see I see pretty pretty low efficiency. So I have not witnessed the super linear there. Um, often when my students come to me and claim that they have super linear convergence, um, it is usually a bug in their code. And I'll send them back to uh, dive in and figure out what's going on. Um, so if our efficiency is less than 1, what are the things that erode this efficiency? Well, uh, the common ones that people are going to talk about, they're going to talk about communication overhead and the fact that when I run in parallel, I have to send data back and forth between processes. And they're going to talk about memory and cache bottlenecks. When I run in parallel, I've got multiple processes trying to access memory or cache. Um, but there's, a, there's also a very uh, simple sort of rule um, or relationship called Omdel's law that also explains why um, why efficiency is less than one. I want to explain that just briefly for a moment. If we take a particular algorithm and uh, and have a look at the total uh, serial execution time, uh, often we can take that that algorithm and think of it as uh, as sort of two fundamental pieces. Um, here are the green blocks are the the parts of the algorithm that I can parallelize. Um, so these computations can be done in parallel, but as is the case with, with any of these algorithms, um, except in the most trivial case, there are pieces of this algorithm that must be computed in serial. Um, and so if you have a look at this particular example, I set this up so that the, the serial portions, the red portions, were roughly 10% of the total execution time. And so if you do a really good job and you, you parallelize the green components and you, let's say you get, um, 100% efficiency for that one piece, for instance, and you run this on two processors, you cut those green portions in half, and when you look at the overall time for the, the entire piece to execute, um, you can see here, uh, because the red pieces, the serial pieces, are not reduced, um, we do not actually see 100% efficiency. Um, and in this simple calculation or example with two processors, we're seeing about 90% efficiency. Uh, where does this really come into play? Um, if we uh, were to surmise that we had a, a machine where we had an infinite number of processors and we had no communication or memory um, bandwidth overhead issues to worry about, even in that case, when we look at the parallel execution time, we, of course, still have uh, this serial component to worry about. So even if we reduce the pieces that can be parallelized all the way to zero um, with a number of processors, we now only see, in this case, 10 times speed up. And so this is really uh, Omdel's law that limits the maximum speed up 
to be the ratio of 1 divided by the portion of the algorithm which operates at zero. Um, and this is a really, really key issue with developing large-scale algorithms. So on one hand, we might be interested in speeding up the code by a factor of 2 or 4 or 8. But if we really want to have a code run on a large parallel architecture and scale to thousands of processors, we have to reduce as much as possible the portions of this algorithm that operate in serial. Um, and this becomes really important when people start talking about the dominant computational time step in an algorithm, and they say, well, we're going to parallelize that, that portion of the algorithm because that's where we're spending the majority of our time. Um, once you parallelize that piece, uh, very, very quickly, some other piece becomes the dominant computational um, bottleneck. And so you really find yourself going down a rabbit hole of parallelizing many, many, many parts of the code in order to see scalability to a large number um, of processors. And this will come out in some of the optimization codes that we've developed where, where we cannot get away with just parallelizing the linear algebra. We have to parallelize all the model evaluation um, and all the scale-dependent operations in the optimization code if we want to see a really good scalability. Um, so to move on with measuring parallel performance, there are two scaling metrics that we take a look at. The first I'm going to talk about is called strong scaling. And I think this is the most uh, common way that we would view uh, looking at speed up and deciding if the parallel algorithm was useful. Uh, in the case of strong scaling, the problem size is fixed and we increase the number of processors. So we have a fixed workload overall, and as we increase the number of processors, we divide that workload more finally. Um, now, the, the ideal case here is linear scaling, where the speed up will be equal to the number of processors. And so what we typically do is we typically plot um, on a figure like this shown here the number of processors that we're using to solve the, process, the problem against the observed speed up. Uh, the dash line here shows the ideal case, and we'll plot x's um, next to that line that show the, the uh, case for our algorithm. Now, this is a, is a, a very favorable figure. Usually, you see speed up kind of fall off, um, as I'm trying to indicate with the, with the mouse here. But this gives you a very quick sort of visual feedback as to how this algorithm is going to scale as we move to larger number of processors. And you will also notice from this that we're interested in using hundreds of processors uh, to really be able to tackle problems that we wouldn't be able to tackle um, in serial, not just uh, uh, four or eight processors. Now, another uh, form of measuring parallel performance is called weak scaling. Um, weak scaling gives you a measure of how the algorithm will perform as you increase the size of the problem and the number of available processors. So here, the problem size grows as the number of processors increase. And in this case, we have a fixed workload per processor. So for this example, the ideal case, this linear scaling, we would have constant runtime. As we added, as we doubled the size of the problem and doubled the number of processors available, ideally it would take the same amount of time to perform that um, computation. And we generate figures again, like I'm showing here um, on the left, where we take a look at the number of processors and the uh, uh, time, actually, this looks, yeah, this is the scale time, but uh, uh, basically, and we're trying to see if, if our algorithm is, uh, has constant runtime and is, is flat as we increase the number of, of processors. So you will see a lot in that, in the literature, the analysis of the strong scaling and weak scaling. Um, you'll see less of the discussion of speed up against the best known serial algorithm, but I think those are also really important numbers to report. Um, so when we develop parallel algorithms, we have an idea of how it's going to perform against uh, against our best known serial codes. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit now about uh, different parallel algorithms that are available for nonlinear optimization. And we can split these into two broad classes. Um, one I, I will basically say an inherently parallel algorithm, and another where the algorithm may not be inherently parallel, but we're going to exploit some structure of the particular problem we're solving to enable. Um, parallelism. So if we take first a look at the uh, block on the left here, um, this is the development of algorithms where the algorithm itself is inherently parallel on, on a general problem or general problem class. Now often, this isn't always the case, but often these algorithms are based on less effective serial algorithms. So they might be based on, on matrix-free methods or 
uh, algorithms where we know we can easily parallelize it, even if those aren't the best known serial algorithms for that particular problem. And uh, uh, in several cases, because we we are working in kind of one of these inherently parallel algorithms, they can be easily parallelized, but we run into the issue where we're comparing the performance of this algorithm against the best known serial algorithms and, uh, and uh, uh, run into the, to the, the issue that maybe the serial performance is so poor that even after we parallelize it, it's not competitive with the, with the serial algorithm. Now, on the other side here, uh, where I'm talking about exploiting problem structure, here, the algorithm itself is parallel, not because of the, the inherent algorithm itself, but really due to particular problem structure. And here is where you see a large family of different decomposition strategies, a vendor's decomposition uh, being one, but, but many other decomposition strategies. Uh, in this side, we can often exploit kind of a high-level parallelism, where uh, we can decompose the problem into sub-problems and then call existing solvers on those sub-problems. Um, or as I'm going to talk about later, we can decompose the linear algebra that we need to solve into um, block decomposed linear algebra where we're calling linear solvers on, on smaller blocks in parallel. Um, so there's these two sort of broad families of algorithms to consider. Um, I'm going to focus uh, more, just because of my expertise maybe, on um, the exploiting problem structure side. And here there are two classes that uh, uh, that we take a look at. The first I'll call problem level decomposition, and the second I'll call internal decomposition. So problem level decomposition is techniques like vendors, Lagrangian relaxation, Lagrangian decomposition, um, or techniques like progressive hedging. So here we are breaking the problem down into a number of sub-problems and then solving those sub-problems. Now these decomposition strategies are typically not appropriate for SIMD architectures, because you'll remember those SIMD architectures they need to be running the same fundamental operation, the same instruction at the same time. And in these cases, we're typically calling uh, sub-problem solvers um, in parallel, and there's certainly no guarantee that those sub-problem solvers are going to follow the exact same execution path. Um, in addition, uh, in a number of examples, we see slow convergence in these problem-level decomposition strategies on um, large NLPs, um, although certainly for some specialized problems, uh, they can perform well. Now, on the other side of this curve, um, if we take a look at internal decomposition techniques, here we take a, a known host algorithm, and we look inside that host algorithm, and we parallelize all the scale-dependent operations inside that algorithm. So if we take a look at an algorithm, for instance, like IPOPT, um, every vector-vector operation and every vector matrix operation and the linear solve we can parallelize those scale-dependent operations to exploit the known problem structure um, and get parallel speed up that way. And nonlinear interior point methods are, are an excellent candidate for this internal decomposition strategy, mostly because uh, the, the key step that they uh, perform is solving a linear system in each iteration, and that linear system retains the same structure uh, over time. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the nonlinear interior point methods. That is certainly where most of our experience in developing parallel algorithms um, lies. So the, the basic idea behind a nonlinear interior point method is to take this original optimization problem and remove the issue of dealing with these uh, bound constraints in, in an active set format or something by pushing them up to the objective function in the form of a, a barrier, um, in this case a log barrier. And so what basically happens here is you solve this barrier NLP for fixed value of the barrier parameter mu, and the objective function is penalized for variables that uh, are getting close to their bounds. And you typically would solve a sequence of these problems, making this barrier parameter smaller, um, and, and under some reasonable conditions can show that the solution of that sequence of barrier NLPs converges to the solution of the original problem. Now, if we have a quick look at, oh, this, just to briefly point out here, there are, are a number of interior point method um, codes out there, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, there's been a lot, of, a lot of development in this area and a lot of open source and commercial codes available uh, that make use of this basic idea. Um, if you want to look just at a very high-level rough uh, flow sheet for an algorithm like this, um, uh, an interior point algorithm, this is the basic structure of IPOPT. 
we initialize the problem and check if the NLP is converged. If it's not, we then focus on the barrier NLP subproblem. Um, if that's converged, we're going to make some modification of the barrier parameter. If it's not converged, then we'll go and calculate our derivatives, our residuals from our from our model. We'll then compute a step direction, which is uh, basically solving a large sparse linear system. Um, essentially some sort of modified Newton's method on the optimality conditions, um, and then perform uh, line search and, and, and the algorithm loops that way. Now, if we look at the dominant computational step in this uh, basic algorithm, it is solving the linear system at each iteration to calculate the step direction. And so surely any parallel code must focus on, on computing that step direction um, efficiently in parallel. However, we can't really stop there. Um, we remember Omdel's law, and we realize even if I can do a great job computing that step direction um, for a typical problem, I may still spend some of my time calculating derivatives and residuals. And so if I want to see a good speed up, um, I have to also look at parallelizing uh, the computations in the model and essentially all the scale-dependent operations. Um, so if we take a look at what happens in parallel nonlinear interior point methods, um, the, the basic idea is that if there's structure in the optimization problem, that induces structure in the linear algebra, and we will parallelize that linear algebra along with the scale-dependent operations in the algorithm uh, to, to end up with an algorithm that can solve in parallel much, uh, much more efficiently. Um, compared with the problem-level decomposition strategies, I will say that implementation of these techniques is very time-consuming because we have to dive into the algorithm itself. We have to find every single computation that, that might be scale dependent, and then we have to write a version of that computation that is aware of the structure of a particular problem class. And then if we change the problem we're solving, we have to go and dive in and do that, uh, that same uh, step again. Now, we do have a benefit here in that since we're just parallelizing the fundamental steps of this algorithm, we do retain the convergence properties um, and the benefits of the serial algorithm. So, so I would argue there's a lot more implementation details to worry about here, but, um, but there are some benefits if you take the time um, to worry about them. And of course, we, we hope that we can focus on some key problem classes so that uh, people can fit their problems into these problem classes and, uh, and not have to redo the implementation themselves. Um, so the, the most important step here is the step direction that's going to um, have some structure if the problem has structure. So, Let's uh, talk a little bit about ways that we can um, maybe parallelize that linear algebra. Um, there's three categories of methods that I'm talking about here. Uh, the first is general purpose parallel direct solvers. There are, uh, this, this list again of references is not exhaustive. There's been a lot of recent work in, in developing linear solvers, direct factorization linear solvers that um, can automatically solve in parallel for general spark systems. Uh, the challenge with these is that they have to do some sort of analysis phase or, or some sort of structural decomposition on the, on the linear system. Or, uh, and, and if you look at the results, what you see is modest scale-up, um, maybe up to speeds of, of 8 or 10. Um, but in general, certainly on general, general problems, you don't see really, really high scale-up uh, to thousands of processors based on these general purpose parallel direct solvers. Now, there's another strategy for solving linear systems where, uh, uh, for years, people have been doing parallel computing. And this is in the area of iterative linear solvers. And I'll just give a couple of example methods there. So iterative linear solvers don't do a factorization. Instead, they rely essentially on matrix vector operations to converge the linear system. Uh, they're capable of handling general sparse systems. And they're typically, it's pretty easy to parallelize these. Uh, techniques and and they tend to scale very well. Um, another key issue here is that these uh, there have been a number of of these algorithms written uh, for GPUs and they're appropriate for SIMD architectures. So some of these massively parallel architectures um, can really take advantage of these techniques. The challenge here is that the linear system requires effective preconditioning. And if you look at a lot of the research in this area for different problems, even solving PD systems and certainly in optimization. The research is around uh, trying to develop effective preconditioners for these algorithms. And it could be very, very challenging um, for nonlinear optimization codes to find 
effective preconditioners, um, and, and I certainly don't know of any general preconditioners that, that work really well. Um, so the, the last piece uh, or example that I'll talk about here is looking at tailored decomposition of the problem structure. So here we would assume that the problem has a particular fixed structure, meaning it comes from some particular problem class, and we develop para a custom parallel linear algebra that exploits that uh, known structure. Um, some of the challenges here, this is problem class specific and it can be difficult to implement, uh, but it does have the benefit that if we pay attention to all the details, we can scale these ideas to um, some very large parallel architectures. Um, so if we're doing this tailored decomposition of problem structure, what are some structures that, uh, that we've looked at already and that, uh, that people consider? And I'm going to talk just about uh, three of them. Uh, the first problem class I want to talk about is optimization under uncertainty. And here, uh, this block structure exists because of coupled scenarios. Um, this problem structure is also common in many other applications, including uh, parameter estimation, for instance. Now, if I just uh, show the Jacobian in this case, uh, what you end up with in these optimization under uncertainty problems is you end up with a number of blocks, uh, one for each scenario, for instance, or one for each data set in a parameter estimation problem that would be independent if it wasn't for these sets of common variables on the right-hand side coupling those blocks. Um, now, this is just the Jacobian, not the KKT system, but there are ways to take that, the KKT system, the structure that results from this, um, and do decomposition strategies, usually based on a sure complement decomposition, to try and solve that KKT system in parallel. Uh, the next problem structure that I want to talk about that is, is really important for us is, is dynamic optimization. Now, here, in the way that we typically solve dynamic optimization problems, we take the original uh, nonlinear dynamic optimization problem, and we discretize uh, all of the variables and convert that problem that is optimizing over differential equations into a completely algebraic uh, model with all of those discretized constraints. Now, after you do that, if you use a technique like uh, collocation on finite elements, the Jacobian has a structure that looks something like this one I'm showing here, where there's a, a block of equations, and then there's um, continuity equations or this kind of pass-on structure uh, that links one finite element to uh, the next finite element. And in this case, again, in dynamic optimization, you can do some uh, permutations of this and you can uh, convert this problem to one that can be um, solved in parallel again using a sure complement decomposition. Um, but in this case, different from the optimization under uncertainty problem, um, as you increase the number of processors in this dynamic optimization problem, you create more breaks in these finite element boundaries, and you typically see sure complements increase in size as you, as you break that problem apart. So that's one thing that can impact um, scalability. Um, I'll also point out uh, we do work on spatially connected systems. We're doing some work with um, some epidemiologists looking at infectious disease spread, and here you have a a large spatially distributed model with, with weak, strong and weak communication between those spatial components, um, and you can do things to exploit that spatial structure um, in the problem as well. Uh, the, the actual linear systems that result from this, uh, uh, the structure is a lot more complicated because it's based on the initial network that you start with, so um, I'll just show that graphic there. Um, but the basic idea boils down to if we have something that's in one of these sort of known problem classes, and we've implemented algorithms that can exploit the structure of those problem classes, uh, then we can make these codes available to people to uh, uh, solve their own problems in parallel. Um, I want to go through just, uh, I think we're getting close to time here, so this is probably good. I want to go through uh, some of the timing results um, on different things that we've, uh, that we've looked at. Um, let me back up one slide here, sorry. Um, so we actually have written codes for the optimization under uncertainty, this top class, or um, basically a block structured um, algorithm with common variables that um, we've now integrated with IPOP. Um, we also have a code to do parallel decomposition of dynamic optimization problems. Um, that has not been integrated with IPOP at this stage, um, but, but is being used with a tool called uh, Medelica and JMedelica um, to enable parallel solution of dynamic optimization problems. So, so some of these codes exist to perform these decompositions. I haven't gone over the details of how those decompositions are done 
um, I can refer people to the papers or, uh, or talk about that in more detail uh, later if there are questions. Um, so here I'm showing an, an old example, one of the first, uh, first examples that we looked at with um, doing uh, parallel interior point strategies, and this is based on the IP opt code. So this is a parameter estimation problem. And what I'm showing in this figure is weak scaling results. So on the bottom here, we increase the number of data sets, and in the parallel case, we also increase the number of processors. So you will recall, we, what we would like to see is we would like to see the solution time stay constant as we increase the number of data sets and the number of processors available. On the left-hand side here, I'm showing walk walk time. Um, and so in this uh, parameter estimation problem, the dark black bars here are what happens in serial. And in this particular case, we solved the problem up to nine data sets. At that point, the single machine we had ran out of memory we couldn't, uh, couldn't go any higher than that. Um, whereas if we use a computing cluster here, you can see how the timing results scale as we increase the, uh, the size of the problem. Um, so, so this looks really promising, certainly for um, weak scaling as a technique that can allow us to solve larger problems than, uh, than what we had before. Now, this, uh, the basic approach that was described in this paper is based on a sure complement decomposition, and that requires a, that we form the sure complement, um, which requires a whole pile of back salts, and uh, that we factor that sure complement, and that sure complement is dense. So the, the bottleneck, if you will, in this particular algorithm that, um, that is talked about in that paper, if the number of coupling variables, common variables, gets prohibitively large, say above maybe 100, um, this algorithm can start to lose efficiency because of the time required for uh, forming and factoring that shear complement. Um, now, we have another technique that avoids the need to form and factor the shear complement. Um, these, uh, these results are in a, in a paper that was uh, submitted and under review right now. Um, I won't go too much detail of this example. All I really want to point out here, this is, again, an optimization under uncertainty problem. And if you take a look as we increase the size of the problem, we're using a couple of different uh, serial and parallel algorithms to uh, try and solve this problem uh, more efficiently. Um, what you're seeing here, this FS-S, this is the time for the, the serial interior point algorithm to solve that problem. And after that, it, it uh, ran out of memory and couldn't um, proceed any further. Um, what you notice to the right here, this is the explicit sure complement algorithm that I showed in the, the first set of timing results. And uh, what you see is, is what I was pointing out happens frequently in this case, is the parallel algorithm when solved in serial is significantly worse than, than the best known serial algorithm for that problem. And so here you see the the time degrades dramatically as we uh, uh, as we move to this decomposition algorithm, but solve it in serial. Now, at the same time, we can solve this in parallel, and so we still see um, reasonable reduction in solution times in the next column when we uh, move to solve that problem in parallel. And without getting into too many of the gory details, um, uh, this this other approach over here, this PCG shear complement approach, um, is is even more efficient because it's specifically tailored for problems that have a large number of, of coupling variables. So these are two examples of the optimization under uncertainty structure. Um, this is the uh, weak and strong scaling results for that particular problem. Um, and I won't go into too much detail except that these, these look really great. Um, they're, they're almost ideal up to 128 processors and, and we'd like to see how they scale uh, beyond that for really, really large um, challenging problems. Uh, these are all done on a cluster at Sandia National Labs, and the results may not look the same if it was a, a shared memory desktop multi-core architecture. I suspect we would see poor scaling as they thought for memory bandwidth. And the last problem I want to, uh, or the last set of results that I want to show is a, a decomposition uh, that looks at decomposing the problem in time, this dynamic optimization that I was talking about. Um, and this, uh, this paper was just accepted into computational, uh, into co-op, and uh, uh, so I can send a link there. I don't have the reference here. Um, but this is basically a dynamic optimization of a combined cycle power plant, and what we're looking at is a decomposition in time. And here you see the, the issue that I was alluding to before. Down on the bottom here, we're looking at the number of processors 
compared with the speed up factor. Um, and as we increase the number of processors, you actually see the speed up begin to drop. Um, and this is a result of the fact that the, the problem size or the, the serial portion of the algorithm is not the same um, as, we, as we increase the number of processors. Um, in addition, as we get to a large number of processors like this, we're also seeing uh, communication bottlenecks and things that decompose the, uh, sorry, that, did, that uh, degrade the parallel performance. So this is uh, it is promising, but but we can definitely see fall off as we move to uh, larger numbers of processors. The other thing I'll point out here is if you have a look at this uh, th this particular problem, the ratio of state variables to algebraic variables is quite low, um, and that is a feature that's exploited in the parallel algorithm. If this were reversed, the performance of this parallel code would be a lot worse. So uh, just uh, just keep that in mind. Um, I want to talk very briefly about the software implementation. Uh, given the time constraint here, I'm going to uh, skip through much of this and just uh, just kind of illustrate what we're what we're doing quickly. Um, so, if you look at the core interior point algorithm side of IPOP, there's a very strong um, interface layer between the core algorithm and the NLP interface where model evaluation is done. There's also a very strong interface between the core algorithm and the linear algebra that's performed. And so because of this separation, we can develop specialized problem structures here on the left-hand side that can be evaluated in parallel and have a particular structure without making changes to the fundamental um, interior point, uh, the fundamental IP opt code, the core IP opt code. Now, pairing with a particular structure, then, we also develop uh, custom linear algebra libraries to perform all the uh, linear algebra operations. And we have implemented uh, uh, the, the two algorithms that I talked about above. They're C++ mixed with Fortran. Um, they both use the message passing interface. Um, um, and, uh, and at least for the ones that are already integrated with IPOP, they're available under an open source license. Now, this is all well and good, but the reality is it, you know, it takes a student six months worth of time to, to do this coding and to um, be able to try and get one of these algorithms ready to be uh, to be used on a particular problem, and even to code the particular problem itself. And so we're trying to do a lot of work to uh, develop modeling interfaces that enable this um, parallel computation for users without needing to know the gory details of what's happening under the code. Um, and so we've been working with uh, some people at Sandia National Laboratories on a Python-based modeling language called Pyomo. Um, and uh, one of the key benefits of this Python-based modeling language is, is since it has all of these sort of rich programming features of Python, we can develop high-level um, interfaces or high-level modeling interfaces uh, to Pyomo. So one example is a modeling package called PySP, uh, which helps people formulate stochastic programming problems. Um, and, then, uh, and then Watson and Woodruff have also implemented a progressive hedging algorithm to solve those. Um, PISP problems in parallel. Now, our, our work with this group revolved largely around developing nonlinear extensions to this so that we could then look at nonlinear stochastic programming problems um, and create a link to the uh, parallel methods that we've uh, put into IPOPT. Now, on the dynamic optimization side, um, we've also been partnering with some people at Lund University um, who developed a package called JModelica that makes use of uh, an AD tool called Cassati out of uh, Moritz Deal's group at Leuven. And uh, uh, this package allows somebody to formulate dynamic uh, models in a, in a, a object-oriented kind of modeling environment. And we're now working on the, the link between this to an actual dynamic optimization algorithm inside of IPOP. Um, so, so the modeling languages are a key feature in trying to enable accessibility of these these codes for, for other researchers and, uh, and engineers. Um, so just to uh, wrap up here and conclude, I, I think there's always going to be a demand for optimal decision making, and, and the models are always getting more complex, and they're getting larger, and, and, and that's never going to stop. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that has changed is, is the CPU manufacturers are now focusing on parallel architecture since we're pushing the boundaries of single CPU workstations. So, Parallel algorithm development is required if we want to continue to move forward. Um, and I just uh, want to briefly outline, I said there were four things that we really need to pay attention to. 
the architectures, the algorithms, the applications, and, and their accessibility, algorithm accessibility. So all parallel architectures are not created equal, um, and, uh, and we need to be aware of that when we're designing algorithms. Um, in addition to that, looking at algorithms, there are problem decomposition techniques and parallel linear algebra techniques that we can make use of, as well as some inherently parallel um, algorithms that are out there. Um, I'll also point out it's really important that we know the application well, because often when we're doing some of these decomposition strategies, uh, we may base that decomposition on on key approximations in the in the model, and so you need to know the application area well if you're going to make sensible um, approximations to create a structure that's exploitable. Um, but on top of that, we've targeted some large-scale application classes um, with the hopes that people can fit their problems into these general classes and, and use the parallel codes. Uh, lastly, I think it's really important that these tools be available open source so anybody can use them and modify them. And, and, uh, and we need to also expose them through extensible uh, modeling languages. And so with that, I'd like to uh, close and uh, um, just acknowledge uh, a number of the students that did a lot of the work. Um, and if you want to find out more, you can go to our website at allthingsoptimal.com um, and see some of the publications and, uh, and find out the names of the students that are currently working on things. So at that point, I will stop and uh, uh, be happy to answer any questions that people might uh, might have. Great, thank you, Carl. Um, so let's go to the question portion of our discussion now. And uh, <clears throat> if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to put it in the chat window or uh, unmute your microphone. And uh, so, um, and also one other thing I'll mention, just be um, if you have to go, uh, I will put a couple links here in the chat window. Um, you can go to the YouTube channel where we'll post this uh, presentation today. And uh, and then also you can see some of the upcoming sessions um, there at the other link that I just posted. So let's go ahead and go over to um, to questions. And, and don't forget to unmute your microphone. Um, it's a little red button by your name if you'd like to ask a question. <clears throat> so. So Carl, I have I had one question for you. Um, now in Pyomo, um, I know that uh, you know sometimes these dynamic programming uh, models, you know, we are evaluating the same residuals but with different uh, values over and over again. Is there any effort to, or, or you know, can you say anything about the relative computational time uh, for something like a J Modelica? Uh, between the solver, the modeling platform to deliver residuals and first derivative, and um, and the linear solver. Can you say anything about the relative balance between those? Here and I'll, I'll, I'll back up and, and maybe make the discussion a little bit bigger. So, so first of all, to date, um, Payomo has uh, very preliminary um, approaches for considering dynamic optimization problems. But in the end, that uh, uh, you know, using this simultaneous approach, where you're going to discretize that whole system and create a whole bunch of finite elements and algebraic constraints, in the end, it expands that whole set of algebraic constraints, uh, much like a tool like Ample would do, um, and then sends that full uh, that full model off to the solver. So at that point, aside from maybe any any specialized term matching or something that's done inside the Ample solver library. Uh, you're really not exploiting exactly what you're talking about, which is the fact that uh, that you really took that DAE and you're evaluating that same DAE at different points um, in time, and, uh, and but, but it's not exploiting that um, particular feature. Now, there has been moves inside of the Payomo community to develop a tool that does exactly that, where it's, it's aware of the fact that these problem structures are repeated and uh, may be able to do efficient uh, uh, much more efficient AD because it's aware of that, um, and and maybe even to allow uh, easy evaluations parallel. Now on the other side, uh, the J Medelica tool um, that is used does in fact uh, exploit at least in serial, not in parallel, but does in fact exploit the fact that those um, constructs are repeated, and it can do more efficient AD because it knows that those that, that DAE, for instance, is repeated. Um, so 
the Jane Adelica framework and, and that tie into our dynamic optimization problem does take advantage of that. Again, although uh, we explicitly do the evaluation of parallel, the tool doesn't uh, doesn't allow that parallel evaluation right off the off the top. Now, a couple of things that I will add um, because Pyomo um, does that full expansion, much again like a tool like Ams or Ample would do. Um, you can often see the cost of, of actually just forming these large-scale models becomes um, prohibitive. And so you need to kind of get to the stage where you're forming that model in parallel. And that was one of the reasons why, uh, one of many reasons why we partnered with Jay Medelica on the dynamic optimization um, work is they're actually forming that model in parallel. You know, we, we decompose the structure in time and we're actually forming the model in parallel in addition to evaluating it in parallel. Um, again, like I was saying, if, if, if one part of the algorithm is done in serial, you, you very quickly lose your ability to scale, to scale right. up. And so uh, model formulation is, is a significant portion and has to be done in parallel. Great. Thanks, Carl. Uh, we had a question from Omar. Um, he says, thanks for the presentation. I have a simple question. Can can the parallel computing also be applied for multi-scenario MILP? Um, yeah, so I didn't talk about any of the algorithms for that, but there are a number of, of approaches for solving multi-scenario MILP problems in parallel. Um, and the stochastic programming community has has scads of things, scads of techniques on, on uh, doing that decomposition specifically. So um, yes, there are techniques available, and you can do more than I mean, what, one idea is you just send the extensive form of that stochastic programming problem to CPLEX um, and have CPLEX run in parallel. But that's, uh, in that case, CPLEX has to kind of, well, it's doing parallelism on the branch and boundary, not necessarily on the problem structure. And there are specialized algorithms that exploit the, uh, the problem structure. So I'd be happy to send some references to uh, point somebody there. But, but yes, there are techniques available. Carl, could you put your new um, email address in the chat window? I can. And then we just had, uh, as that's coming through, we have um, a question uh, from Yoshin uh, uh, Steino. Uh, he says, thank you for the comprehensive introduction to parallel computing. My question, I am doing two-stage uh, stochastic optimization where I evaluate all my independent scenario subproblems in sequence in IPOP. Is there any way to parallelize this? If I try uh, to do, uh, if I try uh, to start to start two instances of IPOP, I get errors, and I assume that the IPOP DLL is not built for multi-thread safety. Yeah. So, so let me let me chime in here. The the codes that we uh, or the modifications that we make to IPOP to allow solution in parallel, we actually, um, I, I mean, we basically compile all the numbers. We're not using the the uh, pre-compiled IP options, uh to do this. Now, we have code that is specifically for addressing two-stage stochastic programming problems in parallel um, that uses IP ops. So um, if you want to contact me, I'd be, I'd be happy to kind of talk about how we're doing that. Um, I'd also be happy to, to take a look and dive in the code. If you, if you want to do kind of a more simple um, approach at this stage of, of just evalu evaluating the scenarios in parallel, we can talk about the modifications that we make to IPOP to enable that uh, that compilation and enable it to do that uh, that parallelization. So send, send me an email and, and, and I can go through the details. Uh, on the, just on the surface, you're you're correct. We do special stuff to compile IPOP so so we can enable that functionality. Okay, great. Um, let, let's have maybe one more question. Um, if there are any others? John, it's Jeff Kelly. I, I have a question. Yeah, Carl, thank you. That was very, that was very, very good. Really, uh, very informative. My question is, um, in terms of evaluating first-order derivatives in parallel, um, are the are those automatic differentiation codes are they parallelizable? Do you know what I mean? Sure. Um, so if you look at, uh, for instance, the Argon Labs, the WAP, this is one of the things that they um, work on is trying to do that that automatic differentiation in parallel. 
Um, and they are currently working with, with the group that does PIOMO to make sure that PIOMO exposes the repeating structures exactly kind of like John was talking about in the first condition. Um, so that they can then do that evaluation more efficiently. Now what I will say we do is, is we cheat in the sense that um, we know the structure of the problem ahead of time. So we, we don't use the automatic feature of the AD tools to do this evaluation in parallel. What we actually do is we run multiple instances of the AD tools uh, to do that evaluation in parallel. Uh, easier for us because we're targeting one specific structure. But to give you an example, when we solve a problem in parallel, we actually have, if we have 128 processes, we have 128 separate instances of the AMPL solver library running. Um, each doing their their derivative evaluation. Um, so I guess to summarize that there are people working on tools, but um, and, uh, um, I could probably send an email to the folks at Argon and get a better reference. So I don't don't have you know the exact references in front of me. But if you know the problem has structure, it's pretty straightforward to kind of kind of uh, uh, hijack that process and do that parallel evaluation. So does that make sense? Yeah. If you if you see anybody in this, in the modeling system that we have, we uh, we use. I'm not sure if you've heard, heard of it, the complex step method. So we actually do some parallel derivative stuff by just using Fortran and and uh, perturbing the imaginary part of the variable. And then when you know the sparsity, then you can do the, the graph coloring, and then you can do some pretty cheap um, parallel derivative computations using that that way. Have you ever heard of anybody doing that? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, I haven't seen that in, in particular. So you're probably more aware of the work that's done on Argon than, than I am at this point. But um, this is kind of similar to the way uh, uh, John Betts is um, um, evaluating derivatives in SOX. Um, I don't know that he was doing it in parallel, but he was uh, basically looking at the, the structure of the problem and the graph column to try and uh, uh, figure out which components were separable, so he so he could basically not evaluate derivatives that he knew he didn't have to evaluate. Um, but but it sounds like a similar similar thing to what you're doing, right? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll have to look into that. Thank you. Yeah, and um, send me an email offline, uh, Jeff, and we can uh, um, I can I can fire a few emails to people as well to see if I can drum up references. But uh, the good. AD side is not really my area of expertise, but, mm -hmm. but I can I'll point you to some people who would. Would know. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, well, um, I think that about uh, concludes the presentation. Um, I have uh, you know, the, the upcoming sessions. We have the next one. It's going to be March 25th, and we have Dow Chemical, Anshul, uh, Argawal, and, and John Wasik are going to be presenting on supply chain optimization of chemical. And uh, if you want to see uh, recording of this session, just come over to the YouTube channel. And you will see all of the, uh, I'll post that, I'll try to post that today there. So if you need to uh, refer to this presentation, um, uh, feel free to go there. So um, Carl, thank you so much for the presentation and I thought it was very informative and uh, very exciting, some of the things you guys were working on. You, you definitely um, have some very uh, progressive and, and uh, interesting insights on uh, parallel optimization. So thank you so much, Carl. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, stop the uh, presentation. Feel free to contact Carl after the uh, presentation if you had a, a specific question that wasn't answered today. So thank you, Carl. Uh, thanks, John. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for joining.